three easy steps. You have uh, details on the steps which we're going to go over They're on this, this sheet of paper, but just basically so we know what they are, it's get organized, schedule your meetings, and ask for the gift. Okay, the ask for the gift is basically going on the meetings. This could also be like a two-hour training, just getting organized even, even more. Um, a lot of times with my clients, we do uh, the types of things we're doing today, you know, it's in like a half-day workshop or a full-day workshop to get um, both the executive directors, development staff, and sometimes board members also all kind of familiar with steps and parts of this process. And then we keep practicing, because when you're trying something new, obviously you're not going to get it the first time. So what I'm hoping is everybody's going to get a bunch of exciting ideas and new tools, and then you can take it back to your offices or wherever you're going to go and, and just think about it and, and practice and bring some new, new skills. So the, the very first thing is you, you have to be, if you're going to go on a new journey, you have to be well prepared. And getting organized is the part about being well prepared for that journey. Who's ever worked with a gift table? So a few people, there's a sample one in your packet that you'll have later. You can, there's a lot of information on the internet about how to use a gift table and, and what they're about. It's, it's a very elegant tool that helps you uh, take how much money you want to raise and divide it by uh, the levels of gifts as well as the number of donors you need. Yeah. And then you can sort of, it's a metric you can use to sort of figure out the work that, that needs to be done. I advise everybody, whether you're, you're using it for a single year, like, okay, we need to raise $100,000 this year, or you're doing a multi-year capital campaign, we need to raise $2 million. It's a great tool to get everybody on the same page about how much money and sort of speculate on the level of gifts. Rewind for a second. In the getting organized section, one really important thing that we did not discuss, and that was on purpose, because this, again, is like, several hours, a three day workshop or whatever, and it's a, it's a process that every organization has to go through to say, I'm assuming for now that if you're working at a nonprofit and you're going to talk to people about money, you know what you need the money for, and you know how to tell your story in a really compelling way. Now, that's a big assumption, because uh, I'd say, I don't care if I work with a startup or an organization that's been around forever, Figuring out that message, and as, as you were saying, that the branding, you know, that, that takes some thought in a way that's going to be compelling. Because often if you're inside an organization, uh, I mean, we all get this way with a lot of things. If we kind of get routinized in how we think about things, and we're not necessarily describing our organization in the most exciting, compelling way. So it, it takes some effort to really figure out how you're going to do that, and, and you can test it with, with people. And, you know, see how they resonate with uh, what you're saying. So for now, just don't forget that it's really important to know what you're asking for money for and tell your story. The next thing, you know, I said at the very beginning that a big gift depends on the organization and we're not going to say one size fits all, but for your organization, it's really important to figure out where you set the bar at the, the, the bottom bar. Okay, so what that means is you're going to want to ideally have a subset of your prospect and donor pool that you're meeting with face to face. And you want to make sure that those meetings are with people who can make a difference to the organization. Okay? Not that, I mean, a $100 gift is really important and can make a difference. I would be really concerned if you were going having a lot of face to face meetings with people who can make $100 gifts. Okay, so you have to decide what a meaningful gift is for your organization that has a lot to do with calculating, okay, we need to raise this much money to balance our budget this year, and we have this much time, like, let's make sure it's anybody who can do $1,000 or more. Some organizations, it's $10,000 or more. Next, you want to be really clear on who in the organization is going to be the person or the people asking for money. And this process that we're going through those people, whether it's the executive director alone, or it's the person, if you have a development director, a lot of organizations just have somebody who's working in development, and, uh, you know, they don't have a, a big 
the development staff. Uh, who's who's uh, anybody here who's a director of development? Anybody here who has works in an office where there's more than one pe person in the development office? Great. The people who are going to do this process in your organization need to be involved in this organizational part. And if you're the development director, you need to pull the executive director into the discussions about how this mechanics works and the, the, the nuts and bolts, because otherwise you're really you're going to be kind of flying blind. You have to have you have to have a lot of like a really strong ally there. Um, and then the two final things that I've got here are uh, this one: uh, calculate how many outreach steps this person or group can make per month. I have a, a spreadsheet up here that you'll get at the end that shows you a metric of that. And can anybody think about why that might be important to, to calculate what you can do? It's time management. Okay. Yeah. So very much so. So you have to take the process of meeting face to face with people <coughs> of means just as seriously as you take any other aspect of the development. <coughs> Puzzle. It's not like, okay, you know, in, in September when we have a little time and our gal is over or whatever, we'll get to it. Every month, you need to know approximately how many people you have the capacity to go out and meet with. It doesn't have to be a lot of people. Um, one person a month is a lot more than zero. If you meet with one person a month, you're going to get 12 people in a year. You're not going to get a gift from all of them. That may, in fact, be some people that you've met a couple times. In that well, but you'll get a handful of gifts if you do your job well. Just imagine though, if you can meet ten people a month. All right. That that's by the way, that's a lot for almost anybody. At Columbia, our job description was you have to go out and meet twenty people a month. Okay. That was I did that the first two years. That's like two hundred people a year. They gave you like two months of slack time or something. <laughs> so that's a very hard thing to do, um, but it works because you go and you meet people. And you tell them your story, and then you tell them your story again, and they give you money. That'll give you personally. <laughs> um, although, you know, those are other stories. But you know, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes a guy shows up in New Jersey with a bag with ten thousand dollars in cash because he wants his kid to get into school, and you have to say no. So that's, that's, that's a whole. Um, so. You can see very quickly that the number of people that you can meet a month has a big impact on the amount of money. And then it also, you want to connect that to the level of money, the level of gift that you're raising. If you're going and meeting 20 people a month and asking for $100, you're not going to get anywhere. But if you're, you're thinking, okay, I'm only going to meet with people who I think could give at least $1,000, it's very different. It's going to, that's going to start um, getting some real money. So, a lot of the clients I work with, if they have a development director, and if they have, if they're trying to do something substantial, either in their their annual program or in a capital campaign, I'm looking at five to eight meetings a month. That's also not easy. That's a lot, but that's that's doable. If there's a dedicated staff person, I like 13 or 15 meetings. But anyway, we'll see in the the form here kind of how all that works out. So, uh, the last part of getting organized is putting together a prospect list. Again, this is something we could talk about for two hours. Uh, to me, uh, it's a very exciting part of the process, and a very um, this particular report that I have here, the prospect management report, is something that I use with almost every nonprofit. Well, every nonprofit that I, I work with, it's a great organizational tool. Uh, I usually use it uh, either in an Excel spreadsheet. More recently, we've been using Google Docs. Uh, who's using Google Docs? Who likes Google? Um, so, the idea here is you want to put all the names of people who may be able to give you gifts at that baseline level you've come up with, and obviously you need to have some names to be able to use this, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and then the power of this document is that it's organized by a date. Okay, so let's say that you have 25 potential donors of $5,000 or more. You can put all their names in there. You have 100, whatever, 10. 
all their names go in that name field. But then you want to make sure that you can organize and structure your time in an effective way. Now, what does that mean? I've literally, I've worked with nonprofits where when we sit down, they're, they're trying to raise 50, 30 or $50 million. But when we sit down and discuss their prospects, we go through 50 names every meeting. Because I, I just can't stop them. They're, they're, they're so eager and they're so disorganized. You're not going to get everywhere, anywhere if you discuss 50 people every time because you can't meet with 50 people in a, in a reasonable amount of time. So you want to figure out, remember we talked about how many people you might be able to do a month and who's going to be able to do it. So you want to figure out reasonably like how many steps you can take a month. You want to put those in your card month. Everybody else you put in future months. So their names are still on the list. If they come up, they walk into your office, maybe they're going to get bumped up the list. But until that month comes up, otherwise you don't have to think about that. But you know they're there. So if you've got maybe five names for right now in September, so say you were starting this process, maybe you want to make October your first month, put five names in October, and if you're the executive director, even if you're doing this just on your own, not talking to anybody about it, you want to organize this process. If you're the executive director, okay, I'm going to call these five people this month. I may not get meetings with them until next March, but these are the first people I'm going to reach out to. If I get through all of them, I'll, I'll do some more, but this is, this is what I'm going to start with. Next step is connected to the uh, next step day is connected to this next step field over here. So you can see the first one is a uh, phone call to set a meeting. Now, this is not like a really important historic document. Hopefully you have a database where you can keep track of like what happened in the meeting. But you just want to, once that next step happens, delete it, put you know meeting uh, meeting to discuss a gift is the next step and a new date. So you want to just keep that process going. Um, this this document is really powerful and it takes attention. Just one last thing on, on this list here, which is, um, so the connection to field, uh, you know, that's where you can put how they're connected to you. There's also, um, you can also use that field for uh, the type of donor that they are. Uh, you might want to title it a little differently, but uh, you know, it can be, is it, is it a individual, are they a board member? Now, the reason I mention that is that when I work with nonprofits on their fundraising, you want to do like a whole integrated approach, ideally, if you're a development person and the executive director. You don't want to have like a separate list of your top corporate people or your uh, corporate donors or your top foundations. You want to manage the details of that separately. But I'd like an executive director to be prepared to say, okay, you know, I need to raise $100,000 this year where are the top gifts going to come from? So that, because then that executive director, development director need to schedule some of their time for foundation meetings and corporate meetings. So you want to integrate that all together. So you're like, you know, see, okay, I'm going to meet with five people in October. But oh yeah, then I, I got to go meet those other corporate people. You want to put it all together. So Um, just in regards to, because I, I'm not sure if you're going to get to this or not, the connection to part is the one that I'm the most interested in. For example, I see a connection to foundation. We have about six of these foundations that have given to us in the last 12 months. And the foundation administrators obviously make it their business to keep you the heck away from the trustees. So, and the trustees are the ones that have the connections. Right. to the big givers, you know, of the community. So I'm curious, you know, in terms of working those particular kinds of connections, what would you recommend? I mean, I don't want to feel like I'm doing an end run around a grant administrator that I have right. a good relationship with. And so, you know. Right. So, um, and even a secretary, I don't mean that in the majority of sense at all, but like, you know, the person that you're calling who's a gatekeeper, you have to treat that person extremely carefully and same thing with a grant administrator you don't want them you know next thing you know it's like they're throwing your grant in, in the garbage if, if right. so um, a lot of that would come through developing connections through your board or trying to find um, connections you know in the community like okay I don't have any if I don't you know I've taken the board of trustees of all the foundations that are my donors and my board of trustees and we've sat in a board meeting and we've looked at those lists and hopefully somebody knows somebody they don't. Then that's a, an exercise of 
of, I like to call it networks, like have a brainstorming session with your board on, what are all the networks we know? Okay, I got my personal friends, I got my business contacts, we have our donors, we have our, if you're, a, you know, depending on the type of organization you are, um, you know, if, if you're, a, I've worked with an Irish organization, so they're like the, all the different, you know, people who are connected to the Irish culture, or if you're an environmental organization, people who are connected. So, so it's like, try to brainstorm around your networks. If you're in a small community, just a, if you're in a small community, um, you're going to find ways to, to get to those trustees, but you've got to be really persistent and creative. I've just been doing corporate sponsorships for the first time ever in these past few months and learned that like no, October is the best time of year for the next year. Is there, all, is there any good or bad time of year for, for gifts, big gifts? Uh, from individuals, no, I mean, you want to have those conversations throughout the whole year. Um, you know, most people, as I think most of us know, they, they tend to do a lot of giving at the end of the calendar year. But you want to have the, the, the conversations throughout the year. Somebody could make a, a pledge to give you a large gift over several years and make that pledge in March, but not make the first payment until December. So it, it, it's, it's a different kind of cycle. You just want to you be doing it. As this example of someone in May and then the next, the last one is someone in October. Um, in order to not lose momentum with people or their attention, what are you doing in the meantime to stay in touch with them or uh, maintain their interest? You mean so you're not able to meet everybody right away? Yeah, yeah so, so like in May, what are, you, what are you doing with the guy who you're meeting with in October? Yeah, anybody have thoughts? I guess you keep them updated with newsletters with what your organization is doing uh, all, all along the way. Yeah, that's, that's great. Other thoughts? Find excuses to send little personal emails if you come across an interesting article with a shared interest. Just kind of say, hey, thinking of you, or, you know, just start something up. Yeah. These are the things that make this a complex process that takes a lot of attention because it's best not to leave people hanging for that amount of time. And at the same time, you know, your major donors are not necessarily sitting at home or in their office going, you know, well, I haven't I heard from them? <laughs> so the other thing about this is that I, I tell my clients that basically um, if somebody is has financial potential that's at the top of the charts, like, whatever that is for your organization, whether it's $10,000 or a million dollars, they should really, almost every month they should be in your top thing, whether you're meeting with them or not, because those are the people who you want to think about on a regular basis. The same person who's setting up the meetings should be the person who's taking that meeting, or is it okay if someone is setting up a meeting for, say, the ED or the I'd say it's a case by case thing, but generally, um, unless you're super, super, super important, and I can't think of an example, but you know, you're the head of a of a multi-million dollar nonprofit, and people don't expect to have access to your time very easily. I, I'd say like there's a lot about this type of fundraising is strong relationships so like if you're the executive director i want to see you calling for the meeting unless um, the development director or the development person could also call to, to schedule that for you especially if they're going to go along on the meeting what about the attitude of the person that's going out and asking should they have this really strong kind of personality that they can sell anybody anything because they're really selling themselves. So not only is it how much they know, it's their attitude. It seems to me that attitude comes into this into play a lot. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, let's also just, we're going to do, do some meeting practice uh, a little later, so let's, let's discuss that then. But basically, um, it's easiest if you're an extrovert. Um, good friend of mine, I don't know if some of you have heard the, the website, uh, Asking Matters. 
uh, write it down. There, uh, Andrea Kilstead and Brian Faber came up with that. It's a great way to, they, they look at basically all the different personality types and how you're gonna do a good job doing this job if you don't happen to automatically you know, be like a, said easy steps, okay, it's not, you know, it's, it's not super easy really, <laughs> but if you think about uh, how hard it can be to extract dollars from foundations and corporate sponsors, and you're doing a lot of it, um, individuals don't have boards of directors and scheduled times when you're allowed to talk to them. So if you can develop a good relationship with people of means, and you have a really impactful story to tell about something that you're doing that's going to make the world a better place. And you can go through the process, you can't be stopped.